we will move on to the last speaker for the session, Joseph uh, Newman. Uh, Joseph is a scientist at the University of Oxford, where he started his career with the Structural Genomics Consortium before joining the Center for Medicine's Discovery. He's been studying helicases for a very long time and mostly centered around DNA repair enzymes. Um, but today he will be discussing some of his like work that was published earlier last year when in a very impressive tour de force, he and Ofer Gileadi presented a, um, conducted a very large XCAM campaign, high throughput fragment based crystallography campaign, which was uh, impressively immediately put into the PDB, into the public domain, uh, which essentially showed that there are five different unique druggable pockets where, um, small molecules could bind. So uh, Joseph, take it away, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, I'm just trying to make the presentation bigger, but um, so yeah, we, as Kumar said, um, I we did a, an XCAM screen on NSP13. So why why would we want to target this protein? Uh, uh, thank you, that's better. So um, it's a family one B helicase. Uh, it works on DNA and RNA. So I think in the cellular context, it's probably doing RNA, but certainly in in vitro studies, it seems to be more robust activity on DNA. It's part of this replication transcription complex, along with the polymerase NSP12, and importantly, it's essential for viral replication. I'm not going to go into too much in what it's doing in that complex, but as far as a target for antivirals, essential for viral release. It's believed to be, and the other the other good aspect of this target is sequence conservation and the identification of possible druggable sites on this. Uh, and on the right hand side of my slide here is some analysis that um, our collaborators Satayesh and, and Matteo Shapira from uh, from uh, SGC Toronto did on NSP13 identifying druggable sites in the RNA and the nucleotide binding and that are also some of the most conserved in the entire genome. So that is good for a, a, a design of an inhibitor that is broad spectrum and may be useful against future emerging viral threats. Okay, so how can we inhibit NSP13? Obviously, there could be a nucleotide competitive, ATP competitive inhibitor. These might have some issues with um, off-target effects. There's DNA and RNA competitive inhibitors that will compete with RNA binding channel, which I've shown here in, in the structure, and also possibly allosteric inhibitors. So what was our approach towards finding inhibitors is, was to use fragments. So um, I'm sure you may have heard about this before, but fragments, due to their smaller size, they're not gonna give highly potent hits like you might get in a high throughput screen. Generally, the fragments um, that we would find would be in a in affinity of around millimolar or 100 micromolar maximum. The idea with fragments is that they, they make high quality interactions with the protein that are actually conserved all the way down to potent compounds and that it's possible to screen a large area of chemicals number of fragments. Uh, there's two approaches to optimization, optimizing the fragments, growing in the middle here. The, um, the initial fragment is, is in millimolar thing in hundreds or maybe sub 100 micromolar. And we've seen that for other targets in similar campaigns that we can get to that. And then it's, it's more traditional optimization to get to lead molecule. The other approach is the, li the linking approach, fragment linking, and it, um, you may have heard about the um, the work on MPRO and the COVID moonshot where they 
managed to successfully link two fragments and really in that single operation they got down to the sort of lead like potencies in one step so that's possible as well um so why um do we um, soak these fragments directly in crystals this is the experiment we're doing we we soak using a, an acoustic liquid handling robot we are directly adding the fragments at quite operations to the crystallization drop we can do this now because of the advances in synchrotron. Initially, these kind of advances were done at in, in multiple synchrotrons across the row. And to do this, you need to have robust crystals, and that was the first step of this journey. So, just answer the slide. Sorry, I've gone too far. Yeah, so we, we, we got some synthetic genes around March. Um, uh, we were quite restricted over this time of what we could do in the lab because of uh, coronavirus restrictions. But we got the first crystals in May um, and quite quickly we were able to optimize to around two angstrom um, and we've got reproducible crystals. And uh, these two people were really key to, to help me get on the way that's this is Leah who was helping with the protein work and Alice at Diamond who helped with the final um, crystal optimization and all, all the mounting so in the middle a picture of the the structure with the two possible sites of inhibition and on the right hand side there's segments so over 600 pounds were solved and we got about 50 to 60 fragment hits sometimes we got hits there's two chains in the the um, crystal and sometimes we got multiple hits on one chain or on both chains this kind of um hit rate is kind of typical for this this technique but there were multiple fragments bound to to tar to target sites of interest so um, one of the hot spots was around the nucleotide binding pocket so we got about 14 fragments here I have to say that the crystals that we so we used to soak had phosphate in in the position that that corresponds roughly to the alpha and the gamma of an ATP so we couldn't replace those phosphates. You know, none of the fragments are super potent that they can replace that relative high concentration of phosphates. The phosphate was required really to make the crystals robust. And I did subsequently try some. We, we have an APO structure, but for, for this crystal-based screening, the phosphate um, crystals really were required to get the, the high resolution allows to identify the hits properly. Um, the other kind of main site of interest is the uh, DNA or RNA binding groove. So this is a long groove. In, in the center, there's a kind of semi-transparent RNA molecule to show roughly the path of RNA. We didn't get an RNA complex structure. We, uh, there are, we have this structure structures that recently came out with have, which have RNA in them. But in the a structure path, so there was this collection on the top right hand side of fragments, and these all mimic conserved phosphate locations in in the RNA, which um, bind to conserved features on on the one A and two A domains that are part of the helicase mechanism. There's uh, on the bottom right hand side, there's a nice fragment that engages a kind of a quite a deep hydrophobic pocket it has some more polar interactions on the outside and also there were some more um, possible merging um, fragments on on the outskirts of the pocket as well so um looking at all our structures we we, we managed to get the the phosphate bound form we also got an apo structure of the helicase and we got nucleotide complexes with AMP, PNP, and these 
were actually all generated as part of the initial search for good diffracting crystals. So is a is it's got some flexibility. So there's significant sites that have different confirmations within these crystal structures. So there's um, the the zinc domain, which is in sort of grey here. It's exhibiting multiple different confirmations. Um, they're not. It's not quite clear how they're linked to the um, to the ATP binding and hydrolysis. The green and the yellow domain, which is the 1A and 2A domains, they exist in two different states, which on the right hand side, you can see that, that those states are bound to um, a nucleotide analog AMP, PMP. On the left, on the, on the left in the center is a state that is in the pre-hydrolysis confirmation, and that has come in a closed confirmation of the enzyme, which is shown below. Um, and on the right hand side, we got nucleotide complexes that sort of resembled the phosphate form. So they were open, they were more like a product complex. So we kind of put all these structures together to come up with a mechanism for how this protein translocates along DNA or RNA. It's not really um, an un a direct unwinding reaction. There seems to be maybe some something more complicated about how NSP13 separates um, RNA and DNA strands. This is a translocation mechanism, which is kind of a, a more simpler subset of the, the unwinding reaction. So it, it's based really on first principles. We know that the, the molecule moves in from five prime to three prime. We have an open and a closed state. And so um, the if we start here in the reaction schematic in the closed state, we move to the open state. Main is and the other moves. Then there's some re release on hydrolysis of nucleotide, and the same transition, the reverse transition from the open to the closed occurs. But this time, the other domain is moving, and the first domain let is remains upon the same part of DNA. So that there's two parts to this mechanism. There's the movement of the two domains, and there's the modulation of the interface between uh, the RNA and the protein re with response to this nucleotide hydrolysis. So the second part of the mechanism and how that is achieved is probably a bit more speculative. We don't have high resolution structures of all the states with RNA bound. But there are some clues based on the, the quite significant movements of this stalk domain, uh, the 1B domain, sorry, which is shown in, in sort of pink here. And we see this move and it forms part of the RNA interface. And that interface, even if you look at those different states enough that you could, you could sort of say that that's part of the mechanism. And also there, there's some more specific nucleotide dependent interactions that are modulated as well. So we can use this information, look at our, our fragments and say, do we have any potential allosteric inhibitors? So uh, on the left hand side, there was quite a prolific pocket um, that bound um, perhaps about a dozen, uh, 11 fragments between the zinc domain and the, the sort of rest of the core of the, the molecule. As I said before, we don't really have a good idea of how this domain movements correlate to the nucleotide binding or the mechanism, but the flexibility here might be important. And certainly in related enzymes, it's been shown to be important. So that's one potential. There was a pocket between the 1A and the 2A domains, which is the main part of the uh, helicase mechanism that found, bound a couple of fragments. And also there was a site that um, 1B describing how this domain might be useful, you might have a function of modulating the RNA interface. And these fragments form some nice polar contacts to that domain. So what, what do you do with all these fragments? Um, 
what's the next steps so you know there's a rich readout from this we we made all the structures available as soon as we could in the pdb um generally these fragments are well in, enumerated in in the sort of commercially available compound collections so you can search those for for um for follow-up compounds and and some kind of computational docking type approach might be useful to to sort of um, prioritize which compounds to buy to purchase next so on the right hand side here i've got one of the fragments that i thought was kind of most promising in terms of the interactions it made with the protein and uh, kind of overlaid the fragment and the docking pose from some docking calculations that i've done the, the compound that's docked obviously has some extra couple of hydrogen bonds here to, to some more conserved residues. So that kind of thing is what we're doing to look at fragments. Uh, we are developing biophysical binding assays. We've got already a, a helicase on winding assay to, to measure these fragments, but I think for, for from um, fragments, it's good to have biophysical assets. You don't know immediately if if um, all the sites will in, indeed inhibit the enzymatic activity. And we're we're also partnering with multiple people looking at follow-ups, either from these fragments, fragment hits, or from other sources such as high throughput screening or DNA encoded libraries. And initially we're kind of working together in open science with the view to just um, get the data out there as, as fast as possible, with as, as little um, barriers as possible. So that's it, I just want to acknowledge. So uh, I we started this uh, work, I was um, working with Ofer Gileadi and his team, uh, Leah especially, who helped with the protein, and uh, Frank and his team at Diamond really took everything from the crystal onwards. They were um, doing all this, the soaking and mounting steps. So uh, thank you to them, and thank you all for, for listening. Thank you, Joseph, for a very nice presentation um, today. Uh, quick, first question that's come up is, do you have any functional assays that you can readily test the activity of the optimized fragments? Uh, I'm guessing that would either be the ATP hydrolysis assay or the DNA unwinding assay. Yeah. So we, we, we've, done, we've done quite a bit of optimization of the uh, 80 of the helicase unwinding assay, which to be honest, I've, I've used so far with um, DNA substrates and this, the activity with DNA is quite robust. It seems easier. That's just a fluorescent based strand separation assay. It's actually described in the literature, but we've used it for other helicases. Um, for um, ADPase activity, the ADP glow assay is, is well established and we use it for other case targets and I think it would also work for this. Do you have them in-house readily to test the prior or to prioritize the fragments or optimize fragment series if there are multiple compounds? Yes, we, we've got those assays in-house. Um, usually we don't, yeah, really test the direct fragments in 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 enzymatic assays we we usually do one round of synthesis looking at uh maybe around 40 or 50 uh variants of the initial hits to test in our first round assays because often initial fragment as they are will only have sort of millimolar level binding and and that's quite difficult even in an enzymatic assay to find reliable hits at that, that potency. Cool, thank you. The second question, given the success of the fragment-based approach, do you see any other coronavirus targets where this technology or methodology could be applied? And does protein stability determine structure enablement or feasibility to this approach? 
think we really need the the crystals we work on um 16 i think it was 16 10 complex and we did get some crystals although they did the frag but they've never really been the, the fragment work as i understand it and we're also looking at n14 we've got some early days but we've got some structure of that on its own that if we can optimize the crystals a little bit uh we might be able to take that um down this road as well cool thank you thank you joseph so with that um i'd like to thank all the speakers all right. today for this very engaging discussion uh, and then i pass it on next to dr jonathan Spector.